Good afternoon. This afternoon, we are proud to have on our show that famous playwright, journalist, activist, and blogger, Mr. Mike Irvin. Mike, welcome to our new studio. Well, thank you. No one's ever accused me of being famous before, but thank you. Thank you. Well, you know you are. I mean, after all, you helped destroy the telethons. So. Well, it helped, I guess. Yeah, okay. No, yes. Why not? Yeah. Now, <laughs> I understand you have a thing called a blog. For those who aren't aware, what is a blog? A blog is, I don't know what the B stands for, but the L-O-G is log. Okay. And uh, it's essentially a... Uh, it could be a diary, it could be just writings online. So what happens is someone who wants to uh, share their writing goes to some blog platform. Oh. Uh, I happen to use Blogger, which is related to Google. And you set it up and then you just enter, you write things and you enter them and you post them and you put them on the internet. Oh. And then you try to build an audience. People use it for... Uh, lots of different things. Uh, some people will use it for their families yeah. and they'll say, oh, we took a vacation and Junior went swimming and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And just their families read it and then there's some places that had millions and millions and millions of readers. Wow. They write about cats or dogs or things like that. Yeah. So, so I just decided to uh, start one. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, what is the title of your blog? It's what? called Smart Ass Cripple. That's and I debuted it in October of 2010. Wow. And I call it uh, expressing pain through sarcasm. Yes. And I mean, you're such a nice guy, but, <laughs> and, you know, how, um, how many have you produced? Uh, well, I try to print about once a week. And uh, I think it's been uh, about five, five nah, almost 400 in those years. Wow. And uh, they're very short. They're usually yeah. anywhere between, uh, oh, 400 and 600 words, around right. 500 words. I just uh, feel that one of the problems with blogging is that people tend to get a little windy right. and they go on and on and on and it can be kind of boring. And so I feel, I believe in shorter entries. Right. And uh, plus that's just what I do better anyway. So right, yeah. they're usually pretty short and takes uh, only about two or three minutes out of your week. Hopefully yeah. you have that much to spare for me. Kind of like my playwriting. I think I write short pieces better than long pieces. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah just how, yeah. I guess we're a minimalist type of guy. Yeah, too. definitely. <laughs> what, um, what are some of your subjects? Well, I almost always write something about disability. Yeah. Uh, but not always. I, yeah. Once in a while, maybe once every uh, 10 pieces or so, I'll just write about something like, politics or right. or something weird that happened to me on the street or something like right. that yeah. and uh the name of the, the title as i the name of the blog as i said is smart ass cripple mm. so i try to make it live up to that somehow which means i try to make something funny about it yeah. and i try to make it mean something in some mm. way or another mm -hmm. and um, like if something happened to me on the street and it's funny or weird or significant yeah. or somehow, I try to relate it to something I think is important. But if not, I'll just put it up there anyway. Yeah. And, but, the, but the idea is uh, the dichotomy. In the very first piece, I wrote how the word smart ass people causes, smart ass cripple causes people conflict because on the one hand, everybody hates a smart ass, but on the other hand, everybody hates, loves a cripple. So right. when you combine the two, People don't know whether to hug you or punch you. Right. And I try to stir up that type of tension because I think that it's good for people to feel that tension right. and to try to figure out why it is that they feel that way and hopefully come to some conclusions about uh, how we look particularly at disability. Right. Um, how many pieces have you written? For that? For the blog. Yeah. Oh, yeah, probably about three or 400. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So do you just, um, how long does it take you to compose a blog? I mean, you sit at your computer, and how long does it really take to compose um, It d depends. One of the things is, is there any research involved? Right. Like if it involves, if it revolves around uh, right. something that's happening, like I just wrote one about uh, how people kill their relatives and then call it love. Right. And it took me quite a while to find the right cases to illustrate right. the point that I was making. The point being that uh, if you kill somebody that isn't a white male, essentially because they're not a white male, right. they call it a hate crime. But mm -hmm. if you can say 
that I killed somebody with a disability, you can get away with saying I did it because I love them right, yeah. and get less time. So that was a point I was making. So I was looking for cases of that uh, oh. reflected that. And I did find one of a woman who put a uh, prescription drug overdose in the feeding tube of her husband Jesus. and then claimed that she did it because she loved him and didn't want to see him suffer and only received 10 years probation Jeez. for a crime that would probably get your life in prison if the guy wasn't disabled. Yeah. So that one took a while, but sometimes I'm just uh, relating something that will flow right out and it will just take an hour or less. Right. Just depends on how long it is and how much uh, there is involved. Right. Is there, um, and I understand you have two books and uh, on your writings, collected from your writings? Yeah, I've taken some pieces from the blog and mm -hmm. from other places, and I've collected them into two, bo two books, uh, and I'm going to, uh, well, the first book is called Smart Ass Cripple's Little Red Book, mm -hmm. and it has a blue cover. Yeah. And the second one is called Smart Ass Cripple's Little Yellow Book, wow. and it has a, a uh, red cover. Wow. And you can look for them on lulu.com. That's, right. where, that's where I have them. And uh, I'm, they're going to be part of what I call the, uh, the 10 book Smart Ass Cripple Trilogy. Oh, I love it. And uh, so I'm, the next one is going to be a uh, little chartreuse book. Wow. And on the blog it says where you can find them and all. But, uh, that's great. But that's, uh, yeah, I, I, I've taken some of those writings with some of my other writings from other places. Yeah. They're all short and compiled them in those books. Right. Um, now, I understand, um, you know, you're still doing playwriting. Uh, I understand you may have a children's play coming up. Yeah, believe it or not, on top of all that, wow. uh, <laughs> that somebody could write Smart Ass Cripple and a children's play. Wow, that's great. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, a good friend of mine is ended up at a uh, wow. children's theater in Texas, yeah. and I sent him a script, and it's a play called Porcupine for Children, and oh, he liked great. it, and... Hopefully in about a year or so in Houston it will be produced. That's great. Yeah. And who is this person? Uh, his name is Tim Fiore. He used yep. to produce. He used to uh, be the producing director of a theater in Chicago called uh, Blue Rider. Blue Rider. And you, you and I did a show there. That, Activities of daily living. Yeah, that you, you, I wrote part of it, and you were in it. And yeah. you're also yeah, in a show there. Uh, and then of course G Man a Day in the Life of J Edgar Hoover. Yeah. Was. I think you know. I think it's so sad that it didn't find a bigger audience because uh -huh. who could? You know, there's so much in that play that is relevant to today. Yeah, you played Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight that Eisenhower and um, Frank Costello. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have any other writing projects coming up? Well, being a freelancer, right. I uh, I do a lot of journalism. Right. I write another column for uh, the Progressive Magazine right. at the website progressive.org. Right every two weeks. So that's essentially what I do for a living. I do other things too, but right. essentially I, uh, Great. Well, I it's do a lot. lot of writing. So um, do you have anything else you'd like to say about your blog? Well, I hope people will come to it. They just have to look up Smart right. Ass Cripple. Okay. The actual address is smartasscripple.blogspot.com, B-L-O-G-S-P-O-T. Okay. But I think if you just put in Smart Ass Cripple, you'll find it. Great. Well, thank you. Well, I think we need to hear your blog, so we're going to take a break and go for it, sir. All right. Well, as I mentioned before, I have the two books, the little red book, which has a blue cover, and the little yellow book, which has a red cover. And these two that I'm going to read are, come, are going to be in the little chartreuse book. Haven't determined the cover, color of that cover yet. All I know is it won't be chartreuse. So, the well, first one is called Trying to Go Straight. There comes a time in everyone's life where you face a critical decision. Do you listen to your heart or do you listen to your vocational guidance counselor? Mm -hmm. I had a hard time taking my vocational guidance counselor seriously because I figured if he knew so much about building a successful career, why the hell did he become a vocational guidance counselor? Behind every vocational guidance counselor is a broken dream. When kids dress up and act like grown-ups, nobody pretends to be a vocational guidance counselor. There are no vocational guidance counselor action figures. Following your heart doesn't always lead to glamour and prosperity. Lord knows smart-ass cripple is living proof of that. But when you follow your heart, 
whatever happens, at least you know where you stand. If you decide to play it safe and, say, sell shoes, you might become a highly decorated shoe seller. But you'll always wonder if you might have been a great cellist. But if you become a great cellist, win or lose, you won't wonder if you might have been a great shoe seller. My mother tried to make me go straight. She wanted me to be an accountant, but I could think of hundreds of thousands of other activities that would be more enjoyable, such as hammering nails into my skull. When I was home for summer break my last year of college, I had a chance to meet the guy in charge of hiring cripples for Sears. My mother saw this as a golden opportunity for me. Sears had a great reputation for hiring cripples, and if I impressed this guy, she thought, he might, there might be a good job in it for me after I graduated, such as writing for Sears catalog. She selected just the right tie for me to wear to the interview. But I said there was no way I was going to wear a tie. I said ties are the most blatant symbol of the superficiality of bourgeois culture. If somebody judges me by my appearance rather than by the substance of who I am, I don't want to work for them. I refuse to play a role in that grand farce. So I put on a tie and I went to Sears Towers. I got to the office and the guy in charge of hiring cripples was there. And guess what? The son of a bitch was blind. I felt so cheated. I wore a goddamn tie for nothing. I could have shown up for the interview naked. But my mother tried to save me long before that. She really did. When I was about 10, she had me watch a movie about the Bible. But the only part that stuck with me was the story of John the Baptist. And that was because a hot woman did a belly dance for a king. And then she said as payment, she wanted the severed head of John the Baptist. And in the next scene, that poor slob, John the Baptist, is being dragged off to the guillotine. Well, that story jazzed me up, and after that, I asked my mom to put a banana in my school lunchbox every day. I had a working man's lunchbox, uh, you know, black and shaped like a barn. I peeled back the banana, I opened the lunchbox, and hung the tip of the banana over the edge. And then I said to all the kids at my table, look, it's John the Baptist. And I slammed the lid down and chopped off the end of the banana, just like John the Baptist's head. This got, me back to, this got back to my mom, and she asked if it was true that I was going around entertaining kids by decapitating bananas. I admitted that it was, and she laughed. She tried hard not to laugh, but she couldn't help it. She told me not to do it anymore, but then she walked away laughing. I realize now that was a pivotal moment in my life. My mother could have sent me away to some religious boot camp where they waterball, waterboard all the smart ass out of you. But she didn't, she just laughed. And, that, and after that I knew I was destined to never take my vocational guidance counselor seriously. I try my best not to be a hypocrite when it comes to my fellow cripples. I really do, but sometimes it's really fucking difficult. I mean, I'm always bitching about how things aren't accessible, so I figure when it's time for me to make something accessible, I damn well better practice what I preach. And nowadays, if you're going to make an event or venue fully accessible, it has to be chemical-free and scent-free. Because human-made chemicals found in stuff like deodorants and perfumes and cleaning products really knock some people on their asses. It can make them gag and faint, and it can be downright paralyzing. So an invitation to any event that's really and truly accessible must ask attendees to please refrain from wearing scented products. This always stirs up angst for me because I don't know if my deodorant officially qualifies as scent-free. Uh, I think it does, but how do I know? And I assume that I'm not supposed to show up not wearing any deodorant at all, I mean, that would make people gag and faint too. So I put on a little deodorant and I figure if anybody gags or faints, I'll just go wash off my pits. And so far, so good. But the extent of my resolve not to be a hypocrite when it comes to my fellow cripples 
was really put to the test recently when my condo was overrun by ants. Ants all over the damn place. I had to get rid of them, but I didn't want to have an exterminator come and spray my place with who knows what kind of god-awful chemicals that might make people gag and faint. I had to find a way to get rid of ants that was 100% natural and organic. I searched the internet far and wide and I finally found a company in Papua New Guinea that had a treatment for getting rid of ants that was guaranteed to be 100% natural and organic. So I gave them my credit card info and shortly thereafter, a package arrived from Papua New Guinea. It was a crate containing two live anteaters. Well, those Papua New Guinea people sure were right. The anteaters sucked up my ants like nobody's business, and before I knew it, all the ants were gone. But then I had a new problem, the starving anteaters. There were no more ants for them to eat, and anteaters are the pickiest fucking eaters on earth. I tried to feed them everything from Doritos to marshmallows, but all they eat is ants and the occasional termite. So what else could I do? I went back on the internet and I placed an order for several hundred thousand ants. I scattered them throughout my condo and soon the anteaters made a comeback. But then I had a new problem. I discovered that when anteaters are happy and well fed, they sure are horny little mofos. And now I was overrun by anteaters. So I looked up a list of anteater predators and determined that the most potentially domesticatable was the hyena. So now I have a pair of hyenas in my closet. Fortunately, the internet is like the black market. You can find anything there if you look long and hard enough. Now, I learned two fantastic things about hyenas. One is they love to watch sports, and two is they don't eat very much or very often. Chowing down on two or three anteaters once a month or so holds them just fine. So once a month or so, I unlock the closet door and I go out to lunch. The hungry hyenas emerge and restore the ecological balance of my condo. Then they retire back to the closet and watch Sports Center. And in order to keep the hyenas population of my condo in check, I had to have them neutered. It wasn't as difficult of a task as I thought it would be to find someone to perform. I'm lucky enough to live in an area where there are plenty of people who will do anything for a bowl of soup. As you can imagine, life in my fully accessible condo can be pretty hectic sometimes, mm. but at least no one can call me a hypocrite. This is Will Cowan from Adaptive Chicago Productions. We have Rob Rotman with us today. He's our man with the entertainment business, arts and culture, and it's not always about today. Sometimes it's about the past, and the past should not be forgotten. Thank you, Will. Well, we just lost Mr. Gordon Davidson, who was longtime artistic director of the Mark Taper Forum in Los Angeles. He was also, um, I think, one of the biggest friends and advocates of our community. Um, I first heard about him when he directed The Shadow Box by Michael Christopher. It's a play about three people facing terminal cancer, but it's a very life-affirming and very, strangely enough, very funny play. Um, th this play is also known because it featured a young Mandy Patinkin just getting a start out, so Chicago's own. Um, he then went on to direct um, the the world premiere of Children of a Lesser God, the story of a deaf woman and her relationship with her hearing teacher. Um, that play went on to Broadway, went on to win an Oscar for, or I'm sorry, first, went on to win the Tony Award for Phyllis Freelich, and then won the um, Oscar for Marley Matlin, our own Marley Matlin. I saw that movie, it was yep. a great, great movie, yeah. And then, um, in the mid-80s, I was uh, in grad school at the University of Iowa getting my MA in theater. 
I wrote 10 papers on how playwrights have dealt with the disabled. Um, I did Richard III, Miracle Worker of Mice and Men. I did um, Children of a Lesser God. Then I did um, Hands of Its Enemy, also by Mark Madoff. Hands, what is it? I'm sorry, Hands of Its Enemy. Hands of Its Enemies. And it's the story of a um, uh, deaf woman writing a play with the help of her alcoholic director. Um, this play premiered at the Forum, Mr. Davidson directed. What made the, that production remarkable was that as the alcoholic director, it starred Richard Dreyfuss, who many know was just coming off his own battle with mental alcoholism. And Dre, what were some of the movies he, he starred in? For um, Goodbye Girl, uh, Close Encounters of the Third Close Kind, Encounters of the Third. and talk about playing a character with addiction. He was Dick Cheney in W. Oh, great. And he great. was totally frightening. Um, so I wrote these 10 papers. I sent them to Mr. Davidson. I got back a lovely letter from him. May I show it? And he wrote me back a letter and said, thank me for all the good research I did and thank me for my care, interest, and sensitivity. He also um, recommended to me a video called Tell Them I'm a Mermaid, made, at, um, taper, made by Taper Media. It's a story of seven disabled women talking about their lives their joys, their frustrations. Tell them I'm a mermaid. I'm a mermaid. Mermaid. And um, uh, he sent it to me. I showed it to my theater company, The Mainliners. An actress named Leslie O'Leary, and this was in Iowa City, said, oh, God, this has to be the best video ever made. An hmm. uh, actor named Mark Brown was so touched. He said, oh, God, it's men, too. You know. And every time I go back to Iowa City, Leslie says, you know, I still think that's a great video. Um, We'll have to find that and show yeah, it possibly. Yeah, it'd be good. Yeah, it, it is remarkable. Um, the woman that, um, one of the women in it is a woman named Victoria Ann Lewis, who went on to help Mr. Davidson found the Puzzles and Solutions program, which gave disabled writers a chance to really do work on plays. And, um, uh, and a woman named Bree Walker, who is a newscaster, who is, was a guest in an Access Gala, living gala a few years ago. Oh. So, um, and then in the late 80s, early 90s, they started um, started Other Voices program at the Mark Taper Forum. And it was to bring together disabled writers and non-disabled writers to work on plays. Hmm. Uh, one of the most interesting plays to come out of it was this little play you may remember, something with bowling in the title, The History of Bowling. The History of Bowling, and who was the author? Mike that, Irvin. Mike yes, Irvin, yes. right. So, I remember what, videotaping yeah. a rehearsal of that. And you know, I, I always remember you know, talk about the reaction to um, tell them I'm a mermaid. That at the end you may remember when Chuck and Lou, the protagonists, give their final speeches about bowling and people cheered and applause. Um, his last, Mr. Davidson's last contribution to the American theater was developing the play Angels in America. Um, Angels what? In America. In America. Okay. Tony Kushner's mammoth epic play about America in the age of AIDS. Um, it's a play of anger, denial, but in the end hope. Um, people may have seen the movie with Mike Nichols, which Mike Nichols directed, and starring Ethel Rosen, um, Meryl Streep is Ethel Rosenberg, and Al Pacino is Roy Cohn, the famous lawyer, who, um, in fact, influenced someone who's been in the news this year. I don't think I have to say who. Hmm. And um, uh, I always say makes Michael Corleone look like a mensch. Ah. At the end of the play, okay, well, can you tell people who don't have any Jewish experience what a mensch is? A good person. A good yeah. person. Which Gordon David what Davidson was, and um, so. At the end of the play, um, Pryor Walter, who is a character living with AIDS, has these final lines, and I think it sums up Gordon Davidson. Oh, okay, we're going to hear a great performance right. now from Rob. Thank you, Will. This disease will be the end of many of us, but not nearly all, and the dead will be commemorated, and we'll struggle on with the living, and we are not going away. We won't die secret deaths anymore. The world only spins forward. We will be citizens. The time has come. Bye now. You are fabulous creatures, each and every one. And I bless you. More life. The great work begins. Thank you. So, Mr. Davidson, in conclusion, you are a true mensch. Your work touched people's lives from Los Angeles to Broadway to Chicago to Iowa City. Thank you, sir, for making us all part 
of your chorus line. May your great work never be forgotten. Shalom. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Rob. And You're welcome, Will. Great. Thanks. Very good. Yeah. Very good. And remember, the past never dies. Right. It lives on.